Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Today is a comprehensivist Wednesdays that we do in collaboration with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. It's always delightful to have Sanjay here. He's been giving us such an amazing tour of neuroscience. And today he's talking about a topic which is, I am just completely fascinated by, which is time. So Sanjay, please take it away. Okay, um, so thanks. Um, so yeah, tonight I think we'll what we'll do is we'll go into um, something that uh, we all experience. We have um, various experiences of it, um, and it's uh, it's actually a little challenging because when we first think about time, it seems pretty standard. You know, there's nothing uh, unique about it. But when we get into it, um, it's actually much more complicated than um, than uh, than we we first uh, it appears. Um, so first, what I'll do is I'm going to go a little bit into uh, time. So let me just, uh, one second, let me just get my PowerPoint going. Um, I just need to do a screen share. I think this should be the one. And I'm pretty sure I don't have audio this time, so it should be okay. Um, hopefully everybody sees, uh, sees what the screen has. Yep. Okay, all right. So first, what I wanted to do is just um, go into what is time? And this is not as uh, simple a question as, as we may think. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's such a complicated question. And um, the people who have tried to answer it, um, everyone's come to the realization that, uh, you know, for, for us uh, um, ordinary people, it's, it's almost impossible to define completely. We can define it in, in certain ways, but it's actually very, very complicated to define. Um, what we do know is that it's it's ephemeral. It's an ephemeral concept. Um, it cannot be defined. Scholars from uh, time immemorial have, have tried to, uh, to define it. Um, and uh, yet we still have this uh, personal awareness. We have this uh, feeling that uh, that there is this thing called, called time. Um, you know, we, we all have a sense of time, especially um, of, a, um, of time passing. And, and I actually did that pause intentionally because um, when I had that pause, I think everybody became aware that time is passing and he's not saying anything. And that brought to the fore forefront of our minds that time is passing. Um, and normally when I was speaking, I think few people had the realization that time was passing. Some might have, but most people were, were engaged in the conversation, were engaged in what's happening around them. And time was not in the forefront of their mind. But as soon as I introduced that pause intentionally, I think uh, most people would have, you know, at least had some inclination that time is passing. Um, and it, it, you know, it became a little more definitely aware of that. So that's just a simple example that we are always aware, though oftentimes our brain doesn't focus on it. It's in our subconscious all the time. Um, um, so the sense that um, I'm trying to uh, explain is that we all feel time um, internally, although we may not, it may not arise to our conscious awareness all the time. It's in our mind all the time, at least in terms of a thought and a concept. But I want to delve even further than that because time is actually much more than that. Time exists in our brain um, and in our mind in many, many forms. Um, and in, in this talk, I'm going, going to go a little bit deeper into to go into the various ways and, and you know even the reasons. Although we're not going to delve too much into the reasons, the reasons are, are more or less apparent. But um, you know, the various ways that time exists and how our brain um, uses time. So. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about um, is that um, uh, time is really um, um, a characteristic of the universe. Okay, um, there's a quote that Einstein and Infeld, he was a colleague of his um, in the um, 1930s. They they uh, he they wrote in a, a paper. They wrote that any phys physical phenomenon may be used as a clock provided it exactly repeats as many times as desired. And this is a fairly important idea because this starts to set the stage that time is not really something that we create in our mind. Time is there in the universe, um, or it appears to, to us. Um, and in this sense, 
and, and I, I want to um, make a, a slight divergence here that in philosophy, there are several two primary, two, two primary views. And those two primary views also have, have um, um, been uh, accepted in physics and neuroscience and many other sciences. Though each of the other sciences basically take a dominant position between these two. Um, and in philosophy, the, the two primary views are, are basically that, that time is uh, existent, that it is uh, continuous, that there is a past and present, that time is a thing. Um, that's one view. And the other view is that time is not actually a thing, that there is no such thing as time. There is only the present instant. There's nothing else. And we move from instant to instant to instant. Um, and once we leave the past, once we're in the next instant, then whatever happened in the past disappears and there's no record of it. Um, although in our brain, we know we have a memory, but that memory is not representative of time. This is, this is that um, philosophical layer of thought considers it that way. So using these two methods, um, physics and, and neuroscience actually take the former. They take the, the view that there is such a thing as time. It is a continuous, you can say spectrum, you know, similar to how Einstein defined it, but it's a fourth dimension other than our three physical dimensions. Time is a fourth dimension in, in the world, in the real world. Um, and from what we can tell, at least from what we can see from the brain and its functioning, um, the brain really latches onto this idea of time. Um, so while we can look at everything I'm going to talk about as if uh, there is no such thing as time and, and all of this is subjective and all of this is uh, a projection, um, we can look at it that way, but I don't think that's going to help because there, the evidence, once you start to look into the evidence, um, it starts to become stronger and more, more uh, definitive that our brain definitely engages with time. It encodes time in various ways. It relies on and uses time. Um, and obviously it operates across time. So, so this idea around a physical phenomenon um, may be used as a clock. Um, this is central. So just a, a few simple examples that, that we're familiar with. An hourglass. Um, Sanjay, an hourglass uh, literally... Sanjay, let me, let me just uh, say one thing. Uh, folks, after the presentation, this presentation is going to be about 30 to about 45 minutes. After the presentation, we are going to go into the breakout rooms. So please keep track of all the questions. This is a very deep topic. Please keep track of all the questions that you have. You will have plenty of chance to discuss these in the breakout rooms, and then you come back and ask the best questions that you have. And we will have you know, a Q&A after that. So please keep track of all of that. Um, thank you. Sorry about the interruption, Sanjay. Please go on. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I'd like this discussion. I'd like to, tonight's talk to be more about discussion um, because it's it's a very broad topic. And, and, and some of the things we talk about, as in other talks, when we talk about things, I hope that people remember, you know, the things that we've discussed because they, I'm, I'm basically building upon a lot of the topics that we talk about over time. Um, and in this talk, I, in, in the, the write-up, I had, I had given a, a, a simple hint this actually, we're going to tie a little bit of consciousness into this talk because time actually comes into play. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But in, in terms of how physics and the world um, uh, has time embedded within it, that time exists everywhere. Um, this hourglass is one example where basically, you know, we all know the grains of sand, individual drops or, or clumps of sand fall through a, a thin orifice. And the passing of each grain um, represents um, uh, the passage of time. So the more grains of sand that form, the longer time it, it has, has elapsed. And it's basically proportional, um, roughly proportional, because each grain of sand is exactly the same, same volume. Um, so this is one, one example. Another is a pendulum. Um, as the pendulum swings back and forth, swings back and forth, um, because of the, the laws of physics, the rate at which it swings is relatively constant over, over long spans of time. It's not exactly, but, but relatively on on a place you know, where, where gravity is, is constant. Um, and so because of that, if we measure the number of swings of that pendulum, effectively, it acts as a clock. We can measure time. Um, the same way the ripples in, in water. Um, these ripples float and, and expand over time. And this actually happens in a, uh, in a uh, particular manner in that the, um, the distance between each uh, wave uh, 
um, uh, measures time. It corresponds to a certain amount of time. And if we drop a drop of water into a large pool of water, what we see is when these ripples expand, um, you can actually measure if you, if you put a, let's say a, a stick at a certain point, the number of ripples that pass that stick um, and you count the number of ripples that pass, that can be used as a way of measuring time. Um, another way is uh, the rings in a tree. We all know that uh, trees grow and they form rings. And this is a very reliable method of actually measuring the age of a tree and sometimes even the age of a forest or the age of, it, of an event. Sometimes tree rings capture things like forest fires or cataclysmic events um, within the, uh, the tree ring. And so we can go back and, and date certain events in the world based on, on this measurement of time, this sort of calendar. Um, and lastly, um, most th this is a representation of, of what effectively every clock is. And this, what it's, it's showing is on the left, we have this periodic cyclic repetition. And that's the key. The, the initial quote from Einstein and Infeld was that if there's repetition uh, and it's sufficient enough, so if, if you have a thousand repetitions um, at the, whatever rate it's going, um, then it will allow you to measure something. So as long as you're counting each of these repetitions, effectively you're counting the elapsement of, or elapsing of time. And every single clock in the universe, um, whether you're talking about a cesium atomic clock, whether you're talking about a, a mechanical clock in which a spring rotates and winds and unwinds and winds and unwinds over time, or a pendulum as we talked about, every single clock in the universe follows this principle of a repeating pattern, um, and you simply count the number of repeating patterns. That gives us time. So this is, gives us a, um, a phenomenological, uh, maybe not a definition, but an experience of what time is. The time can be measured using repetition. Um, so let's go further and um, start to look into our brain and what is it that, that our brain, uh, how does time fit in and, and come into play into our brain? So I wanna, I wanna introduce some ideas. There, there's a, a a neuroscientist who actually has done a lot of work uh, in this area. And he proposed four different ideas, four different um, elements that constitute the relationship of time in our brain. And he says that uh, our brain is a machine that tells time. Um, he also says that our brain generates the subjective feeling of the passage of time. Um, he also says that our brain remembers the past and it does that to predict the future. Um, what that means is that um, as we live through life, we form memories and those memories are encoded in our brain. They physically change the structure of our brain, of, of our neurons and interconnections within our neurons, and that encodes our past experiences. And at various times, sometimes we have to rely on those past experiences. We have to come back and, and think about what happened. Um, and when we think about what happened um, and we integrate that with the present now, um, it helps us to figure out what might happen. It helps us to predict the future. So for example, if, um, if a, a fly is flying in the air um, and we have an experience of how flies fly and we see that a fly stops and lands on, on our desk, well, we can predict the future because if we know that we've uh, seen this in the past, we know that flies don't stay, once they land, they don't stay there forever. They will eventually fly off the desk and fly. So we can predict that um, that's one example. Another example is that, is that if we see that fly flying in a certain trajectory in a certain direction, and we see them initiate in a, in a direction, then our brain from experience knows that flies tend to fly in roughly the same direction for, sure, for a certain amount of time, and then they change direction. So as long as we stick to that, our memory of, of how flies behave, we can predict more or less, not exactly, not, not, we won't be able to predict the exact direction that the fly will fly into, but we can predict that the fly will tend to continue for a certain amount of time and then it will change direction. So this is, these are examples of, of predicting. We, we, we encoded into our experiences and our memory is the notion of time where um, when we see an event such as an object like a fly flying, um, we are able to uh, make use of our knowledge of time encoded in our memory. Uh, we can use our knowledge of time to, uh, to say that, um, yes, uh, the, uh, the, you know, what, how the fly will, uh, what will happen. Um, and lastly, um, what time allows us to do, our brain allows us to do is that it allows us to mentally project ourselves into the past and into the future. 
So we can daydream. We can daydream backwards and forwards, basically mental time travel. And this is unique. Um, we don't know if other animals can do this or not, but we humans definitely can. Um, and this is a unique characteristic of our brain where to do that, we have to have the awareness that time is a linear thing that has a future and a past, that it's not static. So this is one of the first indications we have that our brain encodes time in a sense of a continuous linear stream um, where there is a future and there is a past. Now, some might say that, that this concept of, th that this concept of, of, of time being a stream, um, maybe it was taught, maybe it was taught to us in our youth, in our childhood. Um, it's possible because as when I delved into this, I, I wanted to give examples of, you know, what, what, um, when do we start to experience time for the first time? And it's very difficult because children can't communicate this. And most of the, most of the uh, scenarios that I looked at, um, the answer uh, as far as infants, very young children, very young uh, babies, um, the answer posed um, the possibility that many of those things may have been um, taught to them, not taught as in uh, a didactic uh, uh, lesson type of uh, teaching, but experientially they, they picked up from the surrounding world, from their parents, from other people. They picked up this notion. But when I went back and I actually thought about it, there are some instances of time which is encoded in, in even a newborn, uh, you know, one hour old baby's uh, brain. And that's actually encoded when they're in the womb, when they're in utero. And there are many experiences they have in the utero, especially to the end of the third trimester for about a month, where it will basically shape the development of the brain. It will shape how their brain reacts to certain stimuli. Because in utero, at the end, they, they, can, they can experience a lot of uh, many types of um, stimuli um, through the mother's womb. They can hear sounds in a, in a muffled way. They definitely feel vibration. Um, they feel warmth and temperature. Um, and actually, there are many other things. For example, the mother's blood um, is coursing through their veins because at that point, that's how they get oxygen, oxy, oxygenation. Um, they can't breathe, so oxygen and, and blood supply from the mother is very important. So the temperature of the mother's blood actually changes throughout the day because she is going through a daytime, nighttime sleep cycle. Whereas the baby isn't aware of when it's nighttime or when it's daytime. But because her blood temperature changes, her body temperature changes, the activity level around the baby in utero changes, the baby's brain starts to get a sense that there are patterns of, of activity. And this isn't, and, and again, remember, remember the baby's brain is not fully formed yet. So these impressions are not conscious thought. They have nothing to do with thought. Basically they're encoded at a very low hard level um, in the brain in the sense that the baby's body eventually has to learn to regulate its own temperature. And some of that is, um, uh, encoded into our DNA, but some of it, uh, our, the brainstem has to learn based on where the, you know, the environment that the baby is born in. If they're born in a very hot environment near the equator versus if they're born in a very cold environment near the, uh, the Arctic. So there is a variation of that, but, but um, basically the brain, the, an infant's brain has already been able, to, has already begun to encode aspects of time. And if we, if we say that even these are learned, in a sense, yes, we can say that, but the fact is that, that the process of birthing causes the brain to develop with time encoded within it. So by the time every baby is born, it has within it this notion of time. So that's why going forward and, and in, in the field of neuroscience, it's taken, not as granted, but it's understood based on many, many examples like these, that time has been encoded into all of our brains, partly genetically, but mostly um, in, in other ways. So, and, and this is a, a um, quote by a, a neuroscientist, Bonamana, who wrote a book about, specifically about time, which is fairly interesting. Your brain is a time machine. And, and that's what, what these four ideas are from. And so the next idea I wanna delve into is that um, um, time, so, so we talked about this, the time gives us a subjective sense um, and awareness that time is passing. Um, th this is, this is uh, we all learn to have this sense um, in our youth. We also have, um, uh, we also, so I'm, now I'm going to start to go into more deeper areas of our brain where time is, is used. So time is used for perception. And there are active forms of perception and passive forms of perception. 
So a passive form of perception is listening. Um, all of you are listening. And, and what that means is that you're basically waiting. You're not doing anything active. Your brain is not really moving anything other than you may be moving your head a little bit. But in terms of the act of listening, you're not doing anything. You're, you're, you don't have to manipulate any muscles in your body anywhere to listen. The sound waves enter your ear canal, they impinge on your eardrum, they vibrate, etc. They pass through various levels of signaling, and then they ultimately start to enter the cortex, and then they uh, enter the neural matrix. And so there's nothing you have to do. It all happens passively, where the energy from the sound waves goes into your brain, and they become transformed into energy that pass through the neurons, through the neural network. So that is all done passively, and that takes time. Um, uh, so hearing automatically has time embedded within it. But there's another type of time embedment that's within our hearing, which is not um, the typical sense of time that we have. So for example, when we hear, all of us learn about this thing called localization. And we realize that you know, for, we learn about even infants. Um, uh, I'm not aware of infants learning it per se. They, you know, it seems that even a newborn infant automatically can do this. So this is one example where it may be embedded in our, through our DNA, where we have stereoscopic hearing. We have two ears. And to locate the direction of a sound source, of where some sound is coming from, both ears hear the sound at different times. It takes longer for the sound to reach one ear than the other. And what our brain does underneath internally is it processes the delta in time, the difference in time between our left ear and right ear. And if that difference shifts toward the left ear, the right left ear gets the sound first, then our brain realizes the sound came from the left side of our body. And then the, the amount of difference in time actually helps us to locate exactly the angle, angle, angle in which it, it's coming. Um, and vice versa, if, if it, the right ear receives the sound first, then the sound is coming from the right side and, and our, our brain tries to uh, coordinate an angle from which the, uh, the sound is coming. And it, it's a pretty precise way of doing it because most of the time, if we close our eyes and we hear sound, we can tell pretty accurately um, roughly where the sound is coming from. Even at the point that we can tell if it's coming from out, up above us or below us because the sound when it enters our ear canal, our ear canal is a solid uh, structure. And so it can bounce. So if it bounces from one direction downward into our ear canal and you know enters our, our eardrum, it has a different intensity and trajectory in each ear versus if it, it's coming from the bottom and it bounces the top of our ear canal. So we have a very sophisticated mechanism. So even this passive thing called hearing actually uses time in many, many ways to figure things out. Um, another type of, of um, use of time in, in perception is, is all these three examples I'm going to give have to do with vision. Because And vision and hearing are very powerful um, um, uh, sensory uh, organs that we have. Um, uh, they're very powerful in humans. Other animals have other, for example, uh, smell is very important. I'm not going to go into that, but vision. So vision is an act, mostly active type of um, uh, uh, modality. Um, so the most obvious that we all know about is that when we are looking, when we are observing something, our brain decides to choose where our gaze will be. Our brain actively moves both of our eyes um, to look at a specific thing. Um, and that is controlled by our brain. What our brain does is it, it moves our eye at a certain rate of time based on where it wants to go and where our eye is currently looking. So if our eye is currently looking it, you know, in one place, and if our brain decides, I need to look very, very quickly in this corner because I heard a sound that might be you know, something funny. I want to look there quickly. Our brain decides it has to do this very quickly. It figures out the trajectory and the speed at which it has to control specific muscles of the eye, and maybe even our head, um, but specifically our eye, um, and it makes our eye move. Um, and it makes both of our eyes move such that our stereoscopic vision remains while we're moving. So that's a simple example of time with vision. Another example is that what are, and I think most people know this, um, I talked about this earlier, is that when we are when even if we're looking at a stationary image, a stationary object in front of us, and we're not moving and that scene is not moving, our eyes are actually moving. Our eyes are, are oscillating us, you know, and very rapidly, both eyes, they're oscillating very, very rapidly, intentionally. Our brain does this. And this is part of our um, DNA programming 
Um, and what that does is because of the way our retina is, is, is structured, our retina, most of our retina is not uh, highly um, high resolution. Um, only a small part of our retina has very, very high resolution rods and cones. The rest of it has very sparse uh, rods and cones. And so what our eye, what our brain does um, is that it vibrates our eye intentionally to try to amplify the area at which we have greater vision. And also it, it does many things. I'm not gonna go into the signal processing of it, but, but it actually gives us much better vision than we would have if our brain didn't do that. Um, and, and that basically a vibration, if you think about it, is similar to what we talked about earlier about what a clock is, right? A clock is basically repetitive action um, over time, right? A repetitive action over and over and over. Um, and our eye is oscillating over and over and continuously. As long as our eye is open and we're, we're watching, we're looking, our eye is doing that. Um, now that's not necessarily used as a clock, but our brain uses it during the processing of the visual stimuli. The brain has to unencode un the movement because the movement encodes time within it. The rate of moving the eye has time encoded within it. So our brain has to recognize and, and subtract the time from that. And the last example I'm going to give here with, with uh, time and, and vision, there are many others, but I'll just stick to three, is this thing called motion vision. So when I give this example with a fly moving, our, our brain and, and most uh, animal brains, not even our, but reptiles, you know, even, even the lower forms of animals, um, this is one of the first types of, of um, act, visual activity that almost all animals learn to process. Um, and so this, this concept of time actually exists in lower animals also. It's not simply in humans, it's in most uh, of the lower animals also, because what they're doing is to, to a frog to survive, it has to catch a prey, its prey. And most of its prey, it, it, it eats insects mostly, which are flying at rapid speed, relatively rapid speed. And it has to um, shoot its tongue at a moving object. And for it to do that, it has to have a very accurate way to predict. Again, we're talking about prediction. It has to be able to predict where that fly or where that object is going to be in time. Um, so for, it to, for its tongue to actually capture it so that it gets a meal. Now, this concept is actually multi-layered. This motion detection is actually, um, not, actually not the motion, the, the consequence of the motion detection, the example of the fly wanting to eat that fly, let's say, or the frog wanting to eat that fly is much more complicated because not only does it have to do motion detection on the where the fly is, once it has an idea where the fly is and its brain has an idea of the velocity and dire direction of the, you know, the, the speed and direction of the, of the fly, it has to triangulate in its mind the next position where the fly will be, it has to also triangulate the time that its tongue takes to flip out, okay? And it has to basically predict when it's going to cause its tongue to start to move such that the amount of time it takes for its tongue to reach the final destination will exactly coincide with its prediction of where the fly is moving. It has to coordinate all of these. So there's four or five different levels of time encoded this simple behavior of a frog catching a fly. Time is really, really deeply encoded in its behavior for survival. Um, so um, these, are, these are examples of passive and active uh, uh, forms of, of, of time in our brain. Um, so this, what, I'm, what I've said here is that during sensation and perception, um, so actually, so these are things. So another example of, of this is that when I talk about visual acuity, um, what our brain is doing is it's, it's shaking our eyes very rapidly. But the perception we have of vision is not shaky. It's of a smooth, stable world, right? The world is not shaking to us, even though physically our eye literally is shaking pretty much all the time. So what the brain is doing is it removes this messy data, the shakiness. Our brain subtracts it okay, from the visual stimuli that we're getting. It does lots of complicated processing behind the scenes. So what our brain does is it uses time in many ways to massage the, the view of the world that we have, the reality that we see is not real reality we're, we're, because our sensory systems have aberrations in them. For example, our eye vibration is an aberration of our eye. Um, and so our brain has to compensate for the aberrations of our, of our senses and has to compensate for aberrations that exist in the world. Um, and so our brain is doing a lot of this using time to give us a, a stable picture of the world. Now, one idea I want to present here is that 
Um, and, and this it does during sensation and perception. And there's, there's other stages of processing the brain. The question I'm asking here for later is, does it also do this during later stages? Example, awareness. So awareness, for those of us who, who you know, have been in these uh, talks, awareness is an aspect of consciousness, okay? So what I'm asking here, what I'm suggesting here is, is our brain messing with data, fudging with the data for purposes of consciousness, for purposes of giving us elements of consciousness. I won't go too much into this. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but, but this is the question I pose right now that, that does our brain mess with not simply reality, but also time simply to give us a better consciousness, conscious feeling of what is happening, where we are, that we're alive, that we have, uh, that we have uh, free will, et cetera. Um, uh, so continuing on this idea of what happens in our brain uh, with time. So our brain actually can speed up or slow down um, how it processes information based on the types of, uh, the, based on the quantity of information it's receiving, based on the engagement level that we have. There are various modes. I'm not going to go into all the examples, but for example, um, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're, uh, let's say you, you jump uh, uh, a bungee cord, okay? You're, you're, you're at an amusement park and you jump off of a, of a ledge and, and you're on a jumpy a bungee cord and you uh, bounce up and down. Um, for most people, what happens is that their sense of time slows down because, and it's not that they have to think about it. They don't have to think or do anything. It automatically happens. And the reason why that automatically happens is twofold. One is because after you jump off at a certain point, your brain realizes that there's risk. You're no longer standing on firm ground. You're floating in air and you're falling rapidly. Okay, that's one thing that your brain realizes. Your brain kind of realizes there's danger. Second thing your brain start realizes is that because, and, and it, it's not that the brain realizes consciously, this is all subconscious, you know, the word is realization, but it's not really a realization. It's, it's, it's a perception and experiencing. Um, so our brain is perceiving, experiencing very rapid flow of information into our brain. So basically, as you're, uh, as you're bungee jumping, as you start to fall, you fall rapidly and rapidly, and everything around you starts to move quickly. You start to see that the earth is, is moving very quickly toward you. The ground is moving very quickly toward you. You might move your head around. You see everything is moving. But the sensation that most people have is things slow down. And one of the suspected reasons is because your brain intentionally does this. Our brain intentionally does this because it, it doesn't want to lose any information because it's figured out that we're in a risky situation now. So we need to pay attention and we need to figure everything out. We need to pay it, you know, not miss any information that's flowing into us. So our brain intentionally operates much faster. It speeds up its operation. And, you know, systemically what it is, it's actually using more energy, it, it, you know, which is fine because to survive it, it, it does that many times. So it speeds up. So this, the, 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 um, subjective sense that we get is that time has slowed down. It's not that time has slowed down, but our brain gives us a subjective feeling because, and this is, this is important, because normally our brain is used to our, our internal clock moving at a certain fixed rate. And when we're bungee jumping, our brain doesn't change that rate. That's, that's our normal clock throughout the day. And part of it's driven by the circadian rhythm and various other rhythms. So that clock remains at the same speed. Although even though we're getting information at a much higher rate now, when that higher rate is compared to our normal rate of, of time flow inside our brain and our, and our lower subconscious levels of our brain, the higher rate of information flow basically seems to be, it's perceived by us as uh, you know, things are really happening in slow motion, but it's not, you know, our, our, our brain basically processes it faster, but, but internal clock doesn't change. Um, another example, this is engagement. So when you're really, you know, and this is the concept of flow. Um, when you're immersed in something, you're, you're experiencing something that's really fun, really enjoyable, um, you know, you know time, time tends to move too fast. It seems like, oh, I wish this was going to last longer, but it doesn't. And, and this is another example where, where time, our brain can change our sensation of time or our subjective perception of time. Um, another uh, aspect is, is the prediction. Prediction is inherent. So some of the examples that I gave of the frog um, figuring out through the motion, et cetera, this is inherent in our brain. We do this all the time um, to predict. Um, and again, the frog, at some point, again, it is, it's also learned the movement of the fly. 
so it has to be able to predict the movement of the fly. It's learned the speed of its own tongue using memories of the, of the past. Um, and many times in, as a young frog, it may have tried to do this and it, it didn't get catch the fly and it went hungry for hours. And so it, that memory reinforced its, its uh, importance that it has to figure out this concept of time and not only the time in each of these different domains, but how to match the time between when it starts to move its tongue and when the fly will actually be that. So it has to do very complex processing and predicting of time. It has to learn that. Um, and last aspect of this is that in all of these, um, in the frog, you know, for example, the frog, the frog is assuming the time will not stop. The time will continue. That as soon as the fly is, is, is moving, it assumes that there is a future point at which the fly will be and therefore it will have a meal. It assumes the future will happen. The future, it, it assumes that there is a, a future. So this concept of time is embedded in even the simple animals um, because of that, because it's, it's a part of our survival. Um, time also, so time is used in, so I started talking about the different types of, of our sensory uh, and, and cognitive processes that time is used. So time is used in, in the, the most primitive sensation. It's used in perception, it's used in experience, it's used in conscious awareness, which is the highest levels that we have in humans. And it's even used in many others. For example, we're actually moving, the frog moving its tongue, shooting its tongue out in, in uh, somatosensory uh, sense of, of spatial awareness of the localization when you hear a sound, you're trying to localize exactly where in space it is. So in our mind, we have this three-dimensional grid of, of the space around us, and it uses time to locate within that three-dimensional grid where that sound source is coming from. Um, if we're moving our arm, or, or in the example I gave where we have to move our eye very rapidly, our brain knows the speed at which it moves, it knows the amount of time it needs to move. So, so even in motion, even in our uh, actions, not simply perceptions, but even in our actions, time is encoded. So time is there in, in you know, I, I think most, most aspects of our brain. And earlier we talked a little bit about this, I'm gonna expand a little bit on this, that, that our brain merges and removes information so earlier we talked about it merging and removing time, but it also merges and removes information to give us an illusion of a continuous, stable, cohesive world. Um, and this is, is really the, the, the central aspect of time. Now I've got, I've got some examples, um, uh, three examples that I wanna give um, that might help everyone to, to grasp. So, so one of the, the readings that I, in, in, that I linked to has this image. So I'm gonna expand this image full screen. Um, and what this is, is, um, this is a visual, opt it's an optical illusion, but for most people, for about 85% uh, of, of humans, um, if you look deep into the, the dark area um, and you stare at it, um, most people have the sensation that the edge is moving and expanding out. And for some people who don't have that, you can get a sense of it if you start to look toward the edge of, of this image. If you look toward you know, part of the magenta area and part of the black area, if you move your eye a little bit, it starts to give you a sense that, that that area is expanding or contracting. And this may depend on how your, your, uh, your screen is. If your screen is large enough, it'll be easier to see. And if there's no contrasting light or, or reflections on your screen, it'll be easier to see. But, but that, this is one example of it. And, and you can, the article that I linked to, you can go to it and, and find this image, although that image is black and white. I, the magenta version actually enhances this effect. That's why I chose this. Um, and also it links to the art, to the actual research paper that, that goes into this. So you can actually find the Magenta image if you want. Um, there's another image that the article also describes, and that's this image. This is called an Asahi image. It's, it's an ancient image that, and what this image represents is, it represents an image of, of you know, when we we're, uh, pro, you know, prehistoric beings, let's say, we would look up through the tree canopy and we would see an opening of sunlight seep, you know, seeping through the, the cloud foliage. Or another version is that you know uh, you have you have clouds, dark clouds, and the sun is kind of peering through these dark clouds. So no matter what, the center point is very very high intensity. And what both of these images do is that they they actually cause a dilation of our pupil. And what that does, what that means, is that our our uh, brain. The reason why our brain dilates our pupil, either dilates or expands our pupil, is because it's predicting, right? It's predicting what will happen later. It's predicting that either it'll get darker or it'll get brighter in the future, in the near future. And so it's preparing our vision 
to maximize our visual acuity, it's preparing us by either constricting or expanding our pupus, our pupil. Um, and so our brain automatically does this. We don't have to think about it. It automatically does this based on images and, and the environment that we see. So this is another example of our brain automatically using this. This is not that different than the frog shooting out its tongue. Our brain does this automatically um, based on what, what we experience. Now, to me, this image is actually a little bit easier to, to see this effect if it's moved, if it's offset a little bit. And so me, this, this is a little bit uh, easier to notice this. Um, I, I get a better sense that my eye actually is dilated. But anyway, um, um, these are two examples. The third example is, actually I'm going to explain uh, something and we're, we're getting to the end of the, the, the talk here. But um, the third example I'm going to, um, uh, this is a, a composite image. And basically what I'm going to talk about is and we can think of this either as a static image or as, as motion. Okay, either no matter how we look at it, when it's motion, there's even more elements of time involved in this. But even when it's a static image, there, there's still time involved in it. So basically, this is a baseball player who's who's lunging with his glove open right on, on the field. He's got one arm that he basically is bracing his body. He's kind of landed on, on the ground with one arm, and his other arm is outreached with his glove open, trying to catch a ball, right? Um, and we can imagine he's he's in motion, he's moving. That's why he's in this position. So if we see this only as a static image and, and we, don't see, we, don't, we don't see it as a video, even if we see it as a static image, what happens is that our brain processes this image at multiple layers and multiple levels, okay? And one of the first levels, and, and this I've talked about also in past talks, is that our visual system has many, many layers of processing, five main layers and there's some additional layers of processing and so one of the first layers is our, our uh, um, brain basically uh, looks at very, very simple uh, aspects of the image, just color, okay? not much more. And then the next layer is where it starts to find edges and finds to, starts to find um, certain uh, edges. So for example, the, the distinction between the arm um, and the grass uh, forms an edge based on color. And at the top, there's very little that, that forms a distinction. So we see that there's no edges or hardly any edges. You might notice these vertical stripes that we might interpret as edges, even though they're, they're subtle. Um, but basically the next layer of processing is, is looking for uh, elements that will help us to figure out what, what we're seeing. So it looks for edges. Then it might look for patterns. So for example, it might see that the uniform has stripes on it. So it might be, a certain baseball team that, that the player is from based on the pattern on their uniform. Um, we might see, and then the next layer starts to put some of these together. And eventually putting this information, more and more layers of information together, our brain starts to form an idea about what we might be looking at. And then once we have an idea of what we're looking at, then our brain does even more processing and then our brain tries to figure out what's the context of this? What's the situation here? What's really happening? And then we realize, well, this is a baseball player. So we're watching a baseball game. And then the next layer will be that, well, this is not how people, the people don't uh, stand on one arm. This is not a normal type of uh, position that people can be in. It's actually very painful, it's difficult. So more than likely, because we know the game of baseball, more than likely, this is a snapshot in time where the player was, was moving rapidly and the camera just took a picture of him in an instant. So th this is a picture of movement. So our brain adds this layer of information that this is movement, even though there's no movement in the image. Um, so there's multiple layers of information that come out of a single image. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna go into a little bit of explanation of that. So what we're saying here is that perception and awareness of a visual event, it happened, there's multiple information streams and multiple, multiple information threads that, that exist within our brain. They start with the basic sensation of the pixels of, of, from our eye going into our brain. And then there are different levels of information extracted. For example, the color information that's extracted. And then the lines and the, and the contrast, those are extracted and specific patterns and shapes are extracted. And then we get a sense that there's a person here and that's extracted. We get a sense that the person is wearing a baseball glove and that's extracted. All of these things are extracted and all of these are individual threads and um, that each of these separate threads can be processed. And then the processing gives us, the, what I'll do is I'm gonna go to a little bit better. So the processing goes back. So this information, all of this information processing, then eventually it gives us an awareness. 
And I'm going to go through the sequence again in a different way. Informa all this information simultaneously sent to many brain regions and many brain layers. Okay. This is important. So it, goes, it goes to our system one and system two layers. Many of you under, may understand what I mean by that. Um, Daniel Kahneman has, has uh, popularized these two ideas. I, I think of also another uh, system which is rarely talked about, which is the system zero, which is much deeper into our brain. It's actually part of our brainstem. I'm not going to go into too much, but there is a system zero, I believe. Um, so um, all of the sensed information goes into these various systemic layers of our brain. So the system one is, you can think of it as a limbic system. It's, it's a lower subcortical region. Um, system zero is lower than that. It's our brainstem and our cerebellum and, and our um, uh, the palms. And system two is our higher level, the, the cortex that, that we all think of as our brain, but that's actually the, the thinking part of our brain. So this information is sent to, to many different, and within the cortex even, it goes to many different parts of our cortex, the parietal lobe, and even different parts of our parietal lobe. Um, on top of that, the processing, right? So first we have the sensation that we extract the information, Extracted information is sent to multiple regions of the brain. All of this is happening at different time scales, at different speeds, because the color information is extracted very, very quickly. But the understanding of what this is, that there's a baseball glove in this image, that doesn't happen that quickly. That happens much, much later in time. So all of this happens at different, different moments of time. That's important to understand. Um, and then all of this information slowly gets sent back to the cortex, to the main thinking cap of our brain. So one thing that our brain does is it, it, it looks at motion tracking at one layer. Okay, we talked about that earlier. It has an emotional sense, the, the limbic system, and especially the amygdala. And um, it, it gets a sense of an emotional sense of what is it that we're looking at? Is there something I should be concerned about? It basically makes a very simple decision. Is it a foe? Yes or no? And it sends that information back to our higher levels. Um, are different parts of our brain, many parts of our cortex, but also some parts of our, our uh, subcortical areas, also try to classify this, the, the various objects in the scene. It tries to figure out what's my best guess. Is it a food? Is it food? Is it a threat? You know, what possibly could this be? Um, and then much, much later in time, again, these are all you know, different gradations of time, and they are happening in different parts of the brain. And all of these different parts of the brain are sending their results back, the information that they figure out back to the brain, to the, to the main cortex at different points in time. So the cortex is getting tons of information back from this one simple image of a baseball player. And that information is coming returning at various times. But the first moment that the, we see the image, our brain gets the information that, that if it's a static image, it gets the information that there's no movement involved, even though much later, much later when we process this image, we realize this is an image of a moving person. The initial sense that we get is this is not moving because there's nothing literally moving in that image. So our initial um, processing tells us there's no motion involved. Then we get a sense of, of friend or foe. And it says, this is not a, a foe, it's not a threat to us. This image doesn't seem to be a threat to us, um, et cetera. And all of this information gets sent back at, at various times. Ulti and, and these all converge into the cortex and then the cor cortex takes all of these perceptions and tries to combine them. Okay? It combines all of that information, but it also com combines them in other ways. It combines them with the current context that our brain knows about. So our brain knows where we are, right? It knows what's nearby around us. It knows the time of day, for example. It knows many things about the world that we're in right now. So it adds that into what we're looking at. Um, it adds the status of us. Am I hungry? Are my eyes tearing? Am I pregnant? It adds many different aspects of us as a physiological being into this concept that, of, of trying to figure out what is it that we're seeing that we just visually perceived. It may pull into memory because when, when these various um, information from the prior regions, for example, the classification, as soon as our parts of our cortex have classified the object, for example, what it does is it actually goes back. And so these things happen in parallel. So the classification aspect of our brain goes back in our memory and tries to figure out this thing that, that's kind of tan color that's on the end of this thing that looks like an arm. What could it be? It might be a baseball glove. It tries to go back into our memory and figure out this is a baseball glove or is this a baseball? And then it tries to see, is there a baseball within the baseball mitt, right? And so it uses our memory to add detail and context and understanding to the image. 
So all of these things are combined. Um, and eventually, we get what we call awareness. And this is, in, in humans, uh, at the highest level is our aspect of consciousness. We have a true understanding of something as simple as an image. But we realize that even though the image is not moving, it's a static image. It's an image of a baseball player that was moving and he lunged and, and he caught you know, the baseball or not. Um, so let's, let's pause here now and, and we can, um, uh, we can uh, actually not uh, Q&A, we'll, we'll do the um, breakout rooms at this point. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, this is an amazing topic. So next we're going to go into breakout rooms. We're gonna have two breakout rooms, one moderated by uh, Sanjay and one moderated by me. Um, what we're going to do in the breakout rooms is that first briefly, each person gets to talk for maybe two minutes or one minute about any big things that are on your mind. And then ultimately we are trying to come up with the best questions that we can. So let's come up with best questions. We'll run the breakout rooms for about 20, 25 minutes. And then we'll come back here put all the questions on the table. And then we will, you know, we'll ask uh, Sanjay to answer most of them and you can also chime in with your answers. All right, so that's the plan. So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Everybody will be back here shortly. All right. So let's see here. Um, so Jeff, welcome back. It's been a long, long time. So it's nice, nice to see you. Nice to see your smile. You're looking good. Oh, just a second. I want to make sure everybody is can unmute. Give me a second. Hold on, hold on. Yes, yes, go ahead, uh, Jeff. You know, I, I surrendered to the time necessary to get well. <laughs> I, I did, and uh, I, I, I'm reminded also of the of the quote that's incorrectly attributed to the Buddha. You know, is is uh, your problem is you think you have time. <laughs> Good to see you as well. Same here. Let's see. Uh, okay, not everybody is back. Let's give it a couple more minutes. Uh, yeah, we got 40, 40 more seconds, then everybody will be back. So I'm really, really looking forward to the questions. And uh, it's, you know, what, what um, Sanjay is doing is really remarkable. It's taking this entire field of neuroscience and giving us a tour of it. Usually it takes, it is, a, it will take you probably 10 times or 20 times the amount of time to look through these things. And he's kind of, he's boiling it down and giving it to us on a platter. So it's just wonderful. Very grateful. Uh, all right, everybody is back. All right, welcome back everybody. Welcome back. All right. Uh, hi, Sanjay. Hi, Shikant. All right. So folks, it's time for questions. So we'll collect all the questions first. We'll get all the questions from everybody. Try to keep your questions short, not too long, under a minute. You can give a little bit of introduction if you want, but try to keep it un uh, under a minute. And we'll collect all the questions and try to see the shape of all the questions and then organize them mostly from the broadest to the, to the narrowest one and go from there. All right, so go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to put a question on the table. We'll start with Vanessa followed by Jeff. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, now this is kind of, I'm thinking in sports, my unexpected movement affect one's perception of time like a fake. If you're a basketball player and like you're leaning toward the left, but you pass or dribble to the right or like in kickball, you're facing the pitcher, you're running that way, but suddenly you kick towards third line. So maybe the one trying to catch the ball or on defense, could they feel more hurried and like, wait a minute. Excellent, excellent point. Um, so does an unexpected movement 
change your perception of time. Very good. Next up is Jeff. So I, I'm gonna build on this, Vanessa's baseball uh, foundation here, you know, where uh, the, the famous uh, Yankee catcher philosopher, Yogi Berra used to say that the hardest thing to predict is the future. And that um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to what might account for people's differing, uh, different abilities to envision the future, um, even in the developmental stages of life. Um, but just, uh, you know, I, because I'm engaged with people in various forms of strategic thinking, I notice that people really are different in their capacity to imagine not only a future, but certainly different futures as in scenarios. Wonderful, excellent question. All right, folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark to put your question on the table. Uh, I know Doug had a question about music and time. Doug, can you go ahead and put your question on the table? I, I guess it's, uh, I'm veering it now more towards um, brain waves, um, heart rate, um, as our, as our internal music, our, our internal tempo, and uh, how that affects our perceptions, our relations with others, if we're in sync or not, or, or out of sync with others, and, and with uh, our immediate reality as well. Is there a, a healthy um, heart rate, healthy brain rate at which we, we pulse, so to speak, that we cycle? And, uh, and then where is, uh, I guess, feeling safe versus feeling anxious as two poles? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. I'll put that as two separate questions. Uh, safe and anxious. Uh, next up is going to be Marco. Um, is it possible to bend time? Wonderful. Is it possible to bend time? All right. Uh, anybody else, folks? This is your chance to ask questions. Go ahead, Judy. Um, I wanna know about time travel and uh, regression. Uh, this, what happens when you're not in drugs, but you see yourself go back in time and then come back to the present and then go into the future. I've had that experience myself and I've read about a lot of people that have had that. Is, is, what is, is that some sort of time travel? What happens? How, does, how can I explain that? Wonderful. Next up is David. David, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so let's say that it, perhaps we consider it a good distinction to make a difference between a sort of external definition of time and an internal definition of time. Uh, the scientists' time is what they're measuring chronologically with a device uh, is one thing. It's an external examination of a body, a mechanical thing, the brain doing something. That's one way to look at time. Uh, even a mental entity can be looked at this way by saying, look at these reactions happening in different parts of the brain. Uh, a baby, your, one, your write up said, do babies have time? We don't know if babies have time. And you sort of talked about that in your talk. Um, there, you know, if. <laughs> Babies have sequences of things they do in reaction to things as soon as they're uh, able to move. Some things are purely physiologically driven, you know, tap and they respond like that. Other things are driven from an internal urge, which we might say that's a little closer to something intentional. Now, there's this physiological sequencing of things. We, we bats and humans, you know, we can tell where things come from. The bat echolocation, I would not call that the consciousness of time. We don't have that separation and something we're able to even examine. So there is a sense of time that we can say externally to scientists, there's something temporal happening in this creature. Those are all of one kind. Then there's the other sort of time, which is we judge time, we judge intervals, we judge periods, we, um, we have an awareness of sequence, a sequence of our own thoughts. And 
you need this in order to begin crawling. You need this in order to begin reaching for things that something makes something else happen or else there would be no point. You're correlating the effort with the response that's going to come. Once you start doing anything intentional, there's an intentional sense of time. This is before there's even a concept of time, which is some higher, way higher level thing. Now, what would be the significance? And this is always an examined question in neurology of what does it mean that we decide something before we know the time we decided it? I mean, the decision is something about internal conscious time. Looking at it externally as an event of a physiology, and we can answer, oh, you made this decision 10 milliseconds before you moved. What is that, you know, is there something we're learning from that? I mean, we don't even know what a decision is, right? It's, it's not a single thing. It's a marshalling of several things, an elimination of possibilities and a determination in a particular direction. So uh, is there something you can concretize? What is the science that, that we're discovering when we say, what have we learned by saying you decided it, you know, which is different. We're not really answering the question of the internal experience, right? Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, David. L lots of questions. I'm going to put it as two, two big Sorry. questions that I'm going to take I'm, from there. I'm confused. I'm going, yeah. on, uh, I'm going to focus on the external versus internal uh, notion of time, and then the role of kind of intentional time uh, versus kind of reactive time. So we'll, I'll, I'll focus on those two. Uh, next up is going to be JP followed by Madeline. JP. Can our own perception of time affect the way we heal and the way we age? Can a faster perception of time age somebody quickly and maybe suffer faster because of what they go through? And second is, if all of time is one moment, it's all happened past and future, have I really said anything? Well, thank Go. you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, JP. Next up is Madeline, followed by Vanessa. Madeline. Yes. Um, well, what David was talking about, it put me in mind of the recent presentation on uh, uh, trichoplax, that very simple organism. And I was wondering, this is kind of a maybe not central to the topic tonight, but um, would it have a sense of time? In other words, it moves, but not um, voluntarily, so to speak. It moves kind of with mechanically like a bicycle in a way. And uh, it's little, not legs, but little motion things at the bottom. Um, it doesn't have even a, um, a system zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just wondering, does it, would it even have elapsed time? That Wonderful. cool little weird little thing. Excellent. So I'll, I'll put it as, you know, how far down the evolutionary chain do you have to go to, for creatures to have a sense of time? Um, next up is going to be Vanessa. Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, what about those that maybe have experience their main discipline deals with uh, rhythm and tempo, like a musician, a ballroom dancer, someone like maybe meditates or yoga where it's struggle, um, intentional um, rhythmic breathing, um, might they have a more reliable sense of time? Let's say if you did an experiment where you're purposely, you know, fudging it, might their experience be more reliable to what, you know, time actually is, you know, going by the clock? Wonderful. Thank as you. As opposed to someone that maybe doesn't really have any experience with that or, you know, tapping to the beat and so on. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, all right, so I'm going to now uh, have, I'm going to throw these questions at uh, Sanjay um, and we will go from there. Um, again, at the end, I'm going to open it up to talk about your views of uh, time. So, so the next section, I'm going to have Sanjay answer some of these questions. And then followed by that, we're going to talk about what did you get from it? What are your comments on uh, time as such? What are you walking away with? Um, all right. So I'm going to start with, uh, so Sanjay, the first question, I'm going to take uh, David's question about what's the difference between an internal definition of time and an external definition of time? And what, what are the consequences of it? Because if you take the lower uh, 
you know, initially we start with the internal, you know, all animals start with the internal one, having an external. So I'll, I'll put it as a question. What's the difference between an internal definition of time and an external definition of time? And what are the consequences of each? So, so when we're born, um, we really don't have a sense of the external. Um, everything about the external is new for us. So from the moment of birth, we start learning about the external and it takes time literally to, to kind of get a sense of what it is that the external world has in terms of time. One of the earlier things that we notice is the day-night cycle um, and uh, that we notice. Not, not that that's important because again, uh, audio location, localization is important even for infant, but they don't notice that. Um, so everything in the beginning is internal time. And even there, um, there's not, not necessarily just one, uh, my, this is my belief. Um, and, and so there's not necessarily just one uh, clock, internal clock, you might say. There are multiple internal clocks and um, they get um, uh, elaborated on over months and you know, years. And they also may, some of them may become in sync um, because they actually are dealing with similar things, bodily cycles instead of, uh, you know, uh, you know, muscles versus a uh, digestion or something. Um, so uh, inter the internal clock for any living organism is the most dominant clock. But when we're talking about living in the real world, living in this reality, when we interact with the rest of the world, then that external, um, and it doesn't have to be a clock, but the external rhythms of the world um, need to be taken account of. And we have to adapt or recognize uh, how things happen in the external world. So if we're hunting, we have to know the speed at which um, another animal can run. We need to know um, the maximum speed it can run and the maximum speed it can turn and the angles it can turn. So we need to know, know a lot of these things. So, and all of these are included in our memories. So it's not simply our notions of time, internal and external time. A lot of this, a lot of the question has to do also with um, our functioning, our success. You know, and, it has to, and that's based on how we encode and how much information we know about the rest of the world and the times, the timing of the rest of the world. Wonderful. Um, now let's take uh, Madeline's question. How far down do you have to go in the evolutionary chain to find creatures which have no conception of time? So where, where, does, where, where does time first make its appearance in evolution? Um, so I don't know exactly because I, I mean, actually, so there is a, um, Recently, there's another um, uh, paper that I read about hydras. So hydras have one of the most limited types of nervous systems that we can have. They don't have a brain, but they have a, a matrix of cells, which is a very rudimentary nervous system. Um, but the article I was reading had to do more with sleep. So I'm trying to think about, um, they don't have, I don't, so in that sense, their, their nervous system encodes the notion of sleep and sleep is governed by time. Right, sleep has sleep cycles. That's the whole purpose of sleep. And they, and even though they don't have a brain, their need of sleep is not for a brain; it's for the body. And actually, what we learned in sleep science is also that our primary function for sleep is for resting our body, but also our brain. Um, so that's an example where, um, you know, a very very primitive organism which doesn't have a brain but it has a rudimentary nervous system. Um, it doesn't know about time, but it relies on time to keep it operating and functioning. And, and Madeline's specific question about the trigger plaques, that, that um, my answer is that they, again, they don't have neurons, but their cells are the, we can say, we can think of as the precursors to neurons. They're not neur neurons in any sense, but they show some of the behaviors of neurons and they show some behaviors of mus mus muscle cells. They're kind of in between. And so what they're doing is they're communicating information. That's what neurons do. They communicate information, but they do it in a mechanical way. So in a sense, they are a network of information processing um, but I don't think my gut feeling is not that they're dealing in information of time um, because they, they don't really, you know, when, if you look at their movement in the world, they're basically bottom feeders or scavengers. And so they don't hunt. They don't look for necessarily uh, any organism. There might be a very uh, a low level sense of, of chemical sense, sensation, chemical sensory perception, um, but um, that doesn't seem to be driving their uh, their higher, you know, mid-level behaviors, I would say. So I don't think time is, is much involved in, in their, uh, their life. Um, next angle, I'm going to take uh, Doug's question about, you know, we have an internal sense of tempo 
you know, we have musical ability. We, have, we are actually able to tell a rhythm. What, what is the nature of that? And what is the, what is the role of that? How come, how come we have it? And how come it is so good as, as it is in terms of actually telling even like fractions of time? So um, that's a very good question. Um, one of the things that, that we, uh, most people I think will notice, especially people who, who have studied music or have some background in music, that all human beings have music built into us. Um, the concept of tempo or the concept of beat um, is intrinsic in us. We can recognize when we hear, hear bird songs, we can recognize species of birds based on types of tones that they emit and, and even, even uh, um, patterns of vibration, you know, beats. Are, are, and, and even animals, you know, many animals communicate, elephants, for example, and, and certain whales and, and uh, species, they, they communicate using very, very low level vibrations, um, which are sounds, but, but they're sensed in the body, they're felt in the skin. So I think music is, again, intrinsic to us. And, and um, for humans, I, I would say it has to do with the level of training experience that we have with specific types of music and musical exposure. Um, so the more we're exposed and attuned to music, to, to human music, I think the more we'll be able to um, uh, use and deal with more complex areas of time within music. But I think everybody uh, uses music in a sense, uses uh, frequencies in a sense, because time is about frequencies. Wonderful. Next, about perception of time. Um, I mean, I will take like multiple questions. You know, Marco asked about bending time. Then um, I think um, there was a question about unexpected movements. Does that change your perception? Feeling safe, uh, safe, familiar environment versus dangerous, unfamiliar environment. So how, how does your perception of the speed at which time is going change? So um, I'm trying to think of how to combine these ideas. I mean, I, I may not be able to, but, but uh, you know, in terms of bending time, I mean, I don't know exactly what what Doug meant by, or Marco, I think it was meant by bending, but I'm going to interpret it in the sense that maybe our brain warping time. I don't think he means about actual time in the universe, if it is there. Some people think it's not there, but, you know, and what does that mean to bend time? You know, can time be bent in multiple directions in multiple, three, you know, three dimensions or, is, you know, so, in the sense of our brain warping time, our brain does warp time often. Um, the example I gave in, in, in our breakout room um, is that when we're uh, when our eye is oscillating, um, actually not oscillating, when our eye is moving rapidly from one, one place to another, um, during the time at which it's moving, the signals going into our brain are not important and they would be confusing if our brain tried to interpret them because basically it's a mishmash of lots of you know, movement which is not important. And the fact that our brain knows that our eye is moving, it blanks out all of that information, ignores it, and kind of, and it also uh, restitches. So it knows the starting point at which the eye started to move. It knows the ending point where the eye stopped moving. And it kind of stitches together those two points in time as if the movement happened instantaneously. So it sort of bends time in a sense. So yes, that happens. Um, in terms of um, feeling safe and, and, and uh, uh, in a dangerous environment, um, that guess has to do with the um, uh, which level or layer of our brain that's doing the processing. Our, our lower levels, the system zero and system one levels, are dealing at that level. They're dealing with safety or not. Um, and so they would immediately uh, use whatever information it has, even though the information will be very sparse, it may not be very exact, it may not even be complete, but it'll take whatever it can get and try to make a decision and best guess. Um, and so it's moving at a very rapid rate of time, and it sends it to our higher brain areas. And our higher brain areas will tend to treat that with various levels of, of importance, because if we know that we're in a relaxed area, we're in a, a, a comedy club, right? And, um, you know, we heard a loud bang. Okay? That doesn't mean that there's a threat necessarily that loud bang could be a person who clapped, right? And so the context of, of where we are and our awareness of that helps us to interpret that loud bang is not a danger, but simply a clap. Um, so I think time is, is definitely part of our interpretations, low and high level. Wonderful. Next, I'm gonna combine questions from Jeff, David, and my own uh, question that I had. Um, you know, Jeff noticed that 
different people have different ability of projecting future. Um, second, you know, David talked about you know, intentionality versus kind of reactivity in time. So I'll, I'll put it this way. Most of the examples that we talked about are you're, a, you're handling the time here and relatively small amount of now. But there is time where you're, you're trying to plan things for the entire year over multiple people, you know, thousands of people over long distances, over long time. And that conception of time to me seems to be different, you know, far more kind of active where you're saying, what would happen if this happened? What would happen with this happen? Carefully, you know, evaluating all of that and designing and planning, like running a large military operation, for example, or running a large company, the kind of processing of time that is needed for that seems to be different or at a higher level than this. So what, what do you think about, about the, like, is that a different level of functioning of time? It's a, is it a different concept of time? Is it resting on a more primitive concept and something else is added or is it the same? So um, the, the way that time gets used in our brain is, is very, very complicated. It's the same as, as the complexity of how information is, is, is processed. And in a sense, time is information also. Time is another type of information that our brain has. A lot of the time and information comes from within our brain. So in a sense, it's more like our own memories, um, but it's, it's a regularly moving um, memory, you might say. And, and, and you know, in the research that's been done about internal clocks, there actually are basically structures of neurons which repetitively fire off and then they give this internal sense of, of tick, 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 that type of thing. Um, so this complex, um, multi-layered uh, existence of time within most situations that we exist in, especially as, as complex humans, um, it, is, it is pretty complicated. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the context. Um, and a lot of it does, does exist and occur at lower levels, mid layers, higher, you know, at multiple levels, uh, multiple levels of processing, multiple types and multiple speeds of processing and multiple, um, multiple, moments when our brain, our, our thinking brain, our cortex gets answers to what it's trying to use to do the thing it's doing. So, um, you know, for example, um, using uh, um, some, I think it was Jeff who, who asked about our people have different type ways of predicting and they have different um, senses of prediction. And, and that some of that is, is cultural because in different cultures, the, the words, you know, some cultures have many, many words for time. They might have 20 words for time. Other cultures might have three or four words. So it, it's very much uh, that aspect, the cognitive aspect is learned. Um, but it's, it's learned only to the level of sophistication that our brain allows and has built in. So our brain already has many, many layers and, type, and types of awarenesses of time. And so if culturally you learn multiple layers, you'll dig into and link into all of these internal time clocks, you might say, or time, um, time uh, interfaces within the brain that exist. And then your thinking will be more rich from it. But if, you're, if, you're, if you live in a simpler culture where time is really not that important, then even though all of those things are happening in our brain, they remain in our subconscious. They don't rise to our awareness. Um, that, that was an amazing answer, uh, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you. They, you know, kind of accepting that the context in which you live and the complexity of that and the time values, both kind of space and time are connected here. And number of people is also connected to that. So that, that as serving as the background for what is going on inside it, beautifully put. Um, so the last question I want to uh, put on the table for you, and then I'm going to open it up for comments from everybody about time, about what you've learned, any comments that you have time. Uh, you have on time. So, um, so last question is about training. You know, there are practices like yoga, for example, practices like music. Um, even the simple thing that I've noticed, like if you are completely harried and doing something, just taking a deep breath or noticing silence that you, you're talking about, that shapes the way in which you are perceiving time. And that seems to have consequences on your health, on your well-being. Um, so 
I'm putting it as a general question, what kind of training um, can we do to have a better relationship with time, if you will? Um, yeah, uh, I think, um, so one thing that I didn't mention, which, which is, is uh, seen by in, in the research, and it's not simply in the research of time, because most research doesn't use time as a specific data set, but time is included in many, many, many uh, types of research in, in human behavior. Um, and one thing that's seen time and time again, sorry for the pun, but, but it's seen uh, regularly is, is that um, people, different people, have different internal speeds at which they operate, at which their bodies operate, at which their minds operate. Um, and this, this can be described as their level of comfort, their levels of um, ease, um, how they operate in the world, um, how quickly they speak, how quickly they respond. Um, and, and that is, is, it's almost like there's a set point in each person. And that set point can change over time. It's difficult, but it can change. But it seems to be set early in life. And I think that's one of those things that um, it's, it's, it's basically a form of, of internal clock. Um, so if you find that your internal clock is not helping you, let's say you live in a very rural area and your clock is very rapid or, or vice versa, you live in a city and your clock is very slow and you feel you need to change it. Um, I think um, change happens over time and change happens when you are actively engaged, cognitively, consciously engaged in, in doing the changing when you're aware of it. So I think um, you may engage in activities which allow you to mimic what you, where you want to go. So if you want to do something more quickly in time, then find a hobby that requires you to do something more, a little more, or let's say music, right? So there are different types of music, different tempos. So find a area of music, genre of music, which is faster. Jazz tends to be faster. Classical tends to be slower. So you might go toward jazz and, and, and try to learn a little more to um, change the speed at which your brain naturally operates, at least in music. And then from that, springboard into other areas of, areas of your life. Beautiful, beautiful. So now let's slow down the time, the tempo a little bit in our the next phase here. And I will do that by uh, telling a story. Um, the point about the set points, I see this in New York all the time because what happens is that people grow up in different contexts. For example, some people grow up in a rural context. Some people grow up in a suburban context. Some people grow up in a city context. If you, are, if you grow up in a rural context, the number of people that you deal with is relatively few and you know them very well. So the way you talk to them is much slower and much more kind of involved. Fast forward to New York, if you try to do that with the thousands of people you're encountering that are flowing all around you, you would go insane. So you have to be fast. That's the natural thing. Now, what happens, the interesting thing is that when people from outside come here, they see New Yorkers as rude, but actually it's not rude. What it is, is that they're operating at a different speed. So the demand for operating implicit demand. It's not a verbal demand. It's an implicit demand of everybody asking you to move faster than what your set point is, is perceived as rudeness because in the original context, that would be rudeness. You know, they would say, okay, come to the point now. If they were to say that in the rural context when there was no reason to do that, then that would be rudeness. So, so it's it's very interesting. So it's the perceptions, which are which are which are different. Um, uh, I remember, uh, you know, a friend of mine. She was from the northeast, and she was first. She was describing the first experience of visiting Seattle. She was waiting in the grocery line, and she was noticing that everybody was moving and talking slowly. And she was like, "What's happening to me?" And then realize, oh, 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 okay, it's different. Uh, and she was particularly good at perceiving time. So, uh, so but anyway, so that's that's my my story of uh, this kind of different set points. Um, all right, folks. So now it's time to give feedback 
on what you learned from this meetup. What do you find interesting about time? You can take between two to three minutes uh, to talk about it. At, and so take your time to speak. Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to share your thoughts on this meetup or on time. All right, who'd like to go first? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark. I'm gonna start with Madeline. Well, this is uh, wonderful as always, Sanjay, thank you. Um, let's see, so what you were calling a set point, um, I actually had noticed that in people. I think of it as being like the idle rate in a car, uh, like when a car is just sitting there, the, the engine's on, but it's not go, it's not driving. But different people have very different idle rates. And uh, yeah, and it, I don't know, I, I guess I hadn't really thought of it in, in terms of neuroscience before I just noticed it. Thank you, thank you, Madeline. Um, the great, great observation. And I also think that you, you deliberately varying your rate also works very well. If you're used to going at a certain speed, just taking a deep breath will help you. If you're kind of relaxed, doing something that really quickens you up is also going to be refreshing. So it's like the, those differences is what, what, what we notice. Um, if I could just add, so when I use the term set point because that's the that's the default speed. It is, it is like an idle speed. It's a default that we all have. Each of us has a different one. But at times we can change it. And we actually do change depending on the context. So oftentimes when you're when you're I mean, and it's not just emotional state, depending on the location. So at work, it may be different because the people you're around operate at different speeds and you and you uh, you know maps that if they were going slower, then you would slow down, etc. Um, so we don't have just one, but we have a we have a default that uh, if if nothing else is impinging on us, that's the one we always kind of go back to. Wonderful. I always like like love the point about the context because it does make such a big difference. Uh, next up is uh, Vanessa. Yeah, this was a very good discussion, and then you made me think of something is if you're with someone and you slow, maybe match their pace, you can slowly modify, or maybe you have to speed up, but then you can get the shift and they realize, wait a minute, I realize either things are going quick or things are going slower than what I expected. But if you kind of slowly, gradually do it, they kind of become unaware, then they're, oh, you either fooled me or now you, you pulled a fast one on me or a slow one as the case may be. Like I appreciate everyone's perspective and even we can't even agree with the concept of time is, you know, but I real quick, I put this in the breakout room. The one case where you have all three is if you're singing the song, like in an echo, a long tunnel, what you hear, you already sang. And also what you hear is in the past, as like you said, just with the processing of it. And there's the anticipation of what you're going to sing next, which would be the future. So it's kind of like you have all three simultaneously in that experience. I don't know what the philosophers are going to do with that because, you know, the future is coming. You just have yet to throw it out there. It's in your mind, but it hasn't yet vocalized. So my two cents. Yeah, that, that's one example I was going to use. I wanted to use, but I thought it would be too much. So yeah, about singing and, you know, that, you know, there are multiple streams that are always used in, in, in singing. In musical, any kind of uh, musical expression. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it's not just that we have not been able to come up with a complete full definition and full description of time during this meetup. This is what people have been doing since, since time immemorable. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it is genuinely a difficult concept and it's so many things um, you know, brought together uh, and it is serving so many different purposes. And it's it just, it's like motion, you know, it's like, it's just talking about movement and we are living beings. So life is about that. So it's like, it's, it's a concomitant of most things. Um, yeah, just, just to, if I can add to that, I mean, I, when, when I was trying to, because that at the beginning of the talk, I wanted to go a little more into the issues around that. I didn't go too much into it because most, um, so go, I went back as far as, as Plato and, and he tried to define time also, but came, you know, short, um, you know, in modern times, we have many, many scientists who have tried, everybody came up with a version but it wasn't complete enough. 
And the, so the problem is, is not that we can't define time. We can't define it in a way that works in every situation. That's, it's, it's really a difficult, difficult uh, thing. Absolutely. Thank you. Next up is Judy, followed by David. Judy. I was fascinated by today's presentation. It's always a thank you. Um, I think there's more questions uh, to be answered in the future. So I think we should do a redux of, of the same subject and continue on. Um, mainly my questions uh, will continue to be the ones of time travel and what happens with time and anxiety and time and death and time and Alzheimer's and time and death and dying. So there's much more than I, that I would like to explore. Um, I, I can only say that it's very difficult to predict time when it's in the present more than when it's in the past. We can talk all we want about the past and or in the future, we can talk all we want about the future, but the present is really the, the heart of the matter. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, next up is going to be David. Right, another question, I guess. Um, so on the, on the periphery of this discussion, could you comment on um, the, the people who are doing these examinations and research, uh, you know, that circle of thinking in the academic uh, community doing this, do you feel that they have any, um, or to, to what degree do you feel they're connected to and use the philosophic works that have been uh, developed in, you know, at least in the Western canon, uh, which have spent a lot of time examining, a lot of effort examining the concept of time, like Heidegger, Husserl, Kant, who talk about the formation of objects, world objects, the concepts, and behind, for Kant, even at the beginning of this, the idea was everything is sense impressions and concepts. It's that unity, which is human understanding. And concepts always are a time-based thing. They include the projection of possibilities, use. So this is like the establishment of what meaning is in the, you know, for consciousness. So is that, uh, is that literature commonly, you know, respected, used and read at all? So I can't, I can't comment on what most researchers do. I mean, the, the re in the readings that I, that I uh, did for this, um, I found that several researchers did look at it from the philosophical point of view in the beginning, um, because again, time is, is something that we're not sure about. I mean, even though it appears to be in, in all uh, evidence that we have, indicate that it is a real thing. Um, we don't know, we can't be sure. Um, and so they all, you know, many, many researchers go back to uh, looking at, at uh, you know, Kant um, as one of the, the principal and human and, and Heidegger, they look at uh, more modern um, philosophers, um, uh, Bertrand, Russell, et cetera. And the problem is that from philosophy, we don't have an answer yet. Um, but from physics and neuroscience, we're getting answers. I don't. I, don't, I shouldn't say answers. We're getting, we're getting information that seems to make sense. We're getting information that matches our observations, and that's why a lot of the, at least in the neuroscience uh, community, they tend to um, uh, go more in the direction that time is there, it's real, and um, um, you know that, that it's it's an actual actual uh, aspect of our brain, um, but but many scientists still um, keep in the back of their mind that, um, and that's why I mentioned also several times, even in the breakout room, et cetera, I talked about that when we, everything that we look, that we talked about tonight and everything in, in this field um, doesn't say that it can be thought of and it can be explained um, similarly if time was not a real thing, if time was purely subjective, um, it would still make sense except for just a few things. And, and that's why you know, I, I wanted to highlight on those because those few things are interesting enough and they tend to point us in directions where maybe it's not simply uh, you know, conjecture that the time may have an aspect, uh, actual basis. But again, and that's also why I brought in the issue of, of infancy and, and pre-infancy uh, you know, in utero because that's where we start to see that, that time is encoded in us from before birth. Um, and unfortunately, that doesn't help us because we can't get to before then, we can't get to our genetic basis. We can't read our DNA yet um, to see how time is encoded there. But we kind of do see some aspects of it. For example, localization of sound, that's there. And, and in the breakout room, I talked about when a foal, for example, is born. 
instantly it, it, it's able to balance itself. And balancing is in proprioception. Balancing is, is an aspect of, of using time that, that it instantly do, does. And it doesn't learn it. It, 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 it built into its, its DNA, we, we think. So there seem to be indications that, at least in neuroscience, um, you know, ph philosophers have been, um, uh, uh, you know, discussed and, and, and uh, um, debated with and against. Um, but the thinking seems to be that yes, it's a real thing. Uh, let me let's take uh, Judy's question on uh, just one aspect of it of time and dying, time and aging, time and losing capability like Alzheimer. So what happens to time during that stage of life? How is perception of time change? So there, there are a lot of things that, that would be affected as we age. Um, one thing, as I mentioned, is that um, these internal clocks that our brain has, um, and by that, for that matter, these clocks don't have to be necessarily in our brain. They can also be in our body and our nervous system is throughout our body and different locations. We might have different, uh, you might say clocks. For example, our heart definitely has a, has a, it, now that, that circuitry in the heart is not what gives us the heartbeat, but it modifies the signal from the brain based on the local conditions the heart is aware of. So, so there is a sense of a timing circuit in the heart also, it's not simply in the brain. So the fact that these timing circuits exist in, in our brain and body, um, as we age, neurons die. As we age, um, the interconnections can wane, they can, or some sometimes become stronger. And that tends to cause disruption or amplification of some signals. Um, and that can cause positive or negative. Usually it's negative, but that can cause changes in how our body and our, and our mind works. Um, also, as our uh, some parts of our brain become less capable due to Alzheimer's, due to dementia, due to many other issues of aging, um, when you know how fast it takes for us to remember something will be affected. And remembering, the speed of remembering is a very important aspect of what we talked about. If we are doing something and memory is important in that, usually it is, if we can't remember it, for example, I showed the, the picture of the baseball player. If you can't remember the baseball team that that baseball player is from, um, and the image is important because something about the image, it's important for you to remember the team, and you can't remember it, then your awareness of what that image means will be changed, right? You won't get the full information, the full meaning of that image because you can't remember. So a lot of things get definitely get affected by age. And vice versa, the other end, when we're very young, when we haven't formed enough memories, when we don't have a context, either cultural or personal, we aren't aware of many things, then we might not be able to um, put together a lot of these things that are really happening in us and out, outside of us, but we can't put them together and, and add meaning to them. So it goes both at the early and late stages of life. Wonderful. All right, um, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, I wanna tell you about what's coming up next. Uh, next Wednesday. Um, it's going to be, I'm going to be leading a discussion. It's good. It's the meetup is going to be called conversation on conversation. So what we do here is conversation. So it's a way of rising up and saying what, when the conversation works really well for you, what are its characteristics? When, what do you think is a really good conversation? What are his characteristics? So, and I'm going to do it. I've got this eight stage discussion format that I'm experimenting with. I did that last Wednesday for what is comprehensivism. I did that for Carl Jung, three of greatest, three greatest ideas of Carl Jung. Um, this Sunday, I'm going to do that for stoicism. You know, what are the greatest insights of stoicism? It's all designed, the format is designed for massive participation. So people, many people can put their insights on the table and then we can slowly abstract from that. Uh, and we can learn from what other people talk about because I, I'm telling you that conversation is a very deep topic and many people will come at it from many, many different angles. And I want to, uh, you know, uh, have a, you know, conversation on that. So uh, I hope you'll join us. 
All right. Thank you again, uh, Sanjay, and uh, see you back. Thank you. A month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Great, great questions. Great discussion. Thank you. Bye. Bye.